Okay. So I'm delighted to be able to uh, introduce Bill Pettit to you. Uh, and Bill, thank you so much for, uh, for agreeing to, uh, to speak with me today. It's, it, it's a privilege. Well, it's a pleasure. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, Bill, for those of you who haven't met Bill, is a board registered psychiatrist. He's been working in the field, field of uh, mental health for 40 odd years plus, I would imagine. Um, and Bill was actually um, fortunate to have met and worked with Sydney Banks right back in, uh, in the 80s. I think you met, you first saw Sid in 1983, first of mm -hmm. April. He was my mentor for 26 years. Wonderful. Yeah. And I mean, this is just so great because we're kind of um, blessed to be able to, uh, to hear from you um, who, who heard from and, and was mentored by Sid all those years yeah. ago. So, and, and the, the fascinating thing mm. is we've both um, got, got our own stories of mental health. Um, myself, yeah. as a chartered psychologist, suffered with depression pretty much all my life until about 12 years ago. And then oh. I knew it was gone for good when I um, was first exposed to the principles. And, and similarly, you, Bill, you, you've got some, uh, some sort of history of depression way back. And I think this brings a depth to to the conversation so the, the thread is is coming off antidepressants but i want to go sort of wider than that and i think sure. what, what i what i'd like to start with bill if we could is um a little bit of context around your sense of there being one um one cause for mental health challenges and one cure because i think this really leads right to the heart of the coming off antidepressants discussion. So would you say a bit more about this, what you've said about one cause and one cure? For sure. Depression? Sure, Andrew. Um, do, 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 I suppose there, there's many resources of uh, information about me and it's not about, it's not, a, not about um, me bragging or anything. It's about getting, having people know that there's credibility here. And, right. And like you say, I, I actually was multi-board certified in, in uh, not only in psychiatry, but in adolescent psychiatry and geriatric psychiatry and, and uh, psychosomatic or mind-body medicine, which I right. was taught the residents at West Virginia University in psychiatry for nearly uh, eight years, seven or eight years on the, uh, in the hospital, uh, and also twice boarded in addiction medicine. And, right. um, Worked in in state mental hospitals with um, people that had killed people and in forensic units and and um, people that had been a very um, psychotic for many many years and um, in 1983 April Fool's Day uh, 1983 when I met Mr. Banks and and listened to him and uh, it did it changed my life I don't need to belabor that but I I at the time had 26 and a half years of schooling. I'd been a board certified psychiatrist for a number of years, almost uh, five years and in psychiatry, nine years and out of medical school, 14 years. And I'd been going in and out of clinical depression for uh, 21 years yeah. and had seen six different psychiatrists. Uh, and they were good people. You know, psychiatry is kind of under the gun these days. I, I, I haven't read, but I, I read through cracked, you know, the, the book that, and there's, there's a lot of truth there as far as the diagnoses and stuff that we can talk about. Yeah. But these were good people who wanted to help people, yeah. but they had limited understanding, mm. you know? And um, one of the themes that has really come to me, uh, and, and, I, and I want to get back to your answer, but one of the things that has really come to me is the fact that there is always love. Love is always present within people. Yeah. It's, it's it's the core of, of our essence to me, but without understanding the expression of that love is difficult. Um, and, and it's not out of, it's not out of lack of desire. Mm. It's, out, it's just that people get overwhelmed by their experience and uh, which is cre thought created. Um, so let me, let me go back and have you, uh, Age-related cognitive decline. Um, <laughs> tell me the question. No, I was going to pick your brains around, and, and thank you for the context, Bill. It's extremely important yeah. that people have that because I think you clearly have a lot of experience pre-three principles with with other ways of 
working with people who right. are suffering with mental illness. Right. And, and I think this, this is a fantastic um, perspective that you bring because I think it's, it's all well and good to have discovered the principles and then kind of run with them from, from, from first base. But when you've got something to directly compare with, I think it's even more powerful. So what, where, where I was going was this whole notion of there being one cause and one cure. Yeah. And, and I think it's so powerful because, yes, we, we've, we've come across the DSM and, and, the, and this wide spectrum of conditions uh, that, that people are allegedly having, um, which are only described by symptoms, let's face it. And, 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 and I, I think I'd be very interested in what you have to say in this area about one cause okay. and one cure. Okay. okay. Well, <clears throat> You know, it all goes back to, and, and of course, I know there'll be people at different levels of, of understanding of the three universal principles of universal mind, universal thought, universal consciousness, which is really a metaphor. And, and this is kind of background, I think, to talk about one cause, one cure. But right. it's a metaphor for what people have called God from, from antiquity. Right. Uh, are you familiar with that? The book from the BBC on the history of the world in a hundred objects. No, I haven't come across that though. I I got it at it's it was a BBC series and um, and I'm on I'm on actually on number ninety eight uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, out of the hundred, but it's taken it's been my bathroom reading for a year <laughs> and a half, and and it's incredible. Yeah, but but what you get is that from the history earliest history of mankind. There has been, I was thinking about this this morning, four things. There's been music, uh -huh. dance, uh -huh. song, and those three things, every culture, yes. every culture in the history as far back, there has been music, dance, and song, and most, mo most frequently that is directed towards trying to pay homage to or to have a friendly relationship, something that people recognized was at the source of, of, the, of life. Yes. That there was something, some, you know, they wouldn't sit down and philosophize with you about it, that the, these physicists finally, about three years ago, came to a consensus, 44 of them, saying, we have to admit there was a time there was no matter. Yes. There was just formless energy. Well, our int and and the idea of formless energy and infinity, our our little pea brains don't handle very well. Yeah, they don't. But so I, I'm kind of peeking ahead that the the one cure mm. is having some incremental sense of of that of infinity, wow. and that that we are everything that exists after the Big Bang after create whatever you see creation as that everything that exists has to be made of that formless energy yeah. everything yeah. and now when i was a kid and people told me that god was everywhere i thought that was really weird because that meant he's in my stapler <laughs> my phone my pen but my understanding of god is i understand whatever that I'm going to call that, and I tell people, you can call it Curly, Mo, Larry. I, I don't know if the Brits even know. Do you know the Three Stooges? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You can call it whatever. Some people would see that as sacrilegious, but my point is that you can call it Dave. I had a couple that didn't like to use the word God, so they, I said, what do you like? They said, we like Dave. I said, fine. Yeah. Everything is made of Dave energy. The reason I'm jumping ahead to the solution first is that if we really understand that we are in form the same energy that allows a seed to grow into one of these 80 foot tall palm trees yeah. or my lemon tree to every every uh february they've now from, gone from green to yellow except for a faint of green in another 30 days they're going to be ripe lemons how the hell does that happen every year how do how do the do the the whales go down to the off the west coast of the United States and I suppose other parts of the world they go down to here to Hawaii have their babies and come back every year and know their way back 
and they all have a different, they have every year, they have a different song, but they all have the same song. Mm. Now, we could go on. I mean, if I, if I had nine lives, one of my nine lives would be studying animal life and plant life mm. because we are surrounded by mystery and, and, and wonder. And, and that's been a source of, of uh, exploration for as long as mankind has existed. And we're starting, Mr. Banks was allowed to me was allowed a glimpse into the mind of God that was profound, that, that not many other people have had. I'm not saying none have. Mm. Einstein had a profound glimpse into the mind of God when he saw relativity. Um, when Edison saw the light bulb, he had a glimpse. The light bulb existed already in, the, in that universal mind. Sure. So we're uncovering bit by bit. And, and one of the things that, that the principles, if you start to understand that you have access to that intelligence every moment of your life when you're lost, <sighs> If you know how to allow your little pea brain to quiet down, that 100% of the time you will see where to go. Yes. Now, to the degree that people start to see that, it does change everything. And it's not a should. I'm not telling people that they should. I'm not people telling people that they're that it, that it's not okay to only do it eighty percent of the time or seventy, but but sixty percent is better than fifty. Ten percent is better than one, <laughs> and direction is the key. Yes. But I will say that that direction towards an understanding of what we are as human beings and what we have as resources available to us. That's that that's a that's that's the one cure. Wow. And and wrapped in that is this understanding of not only who and what we are and what resources we have, but that the fact that we are creating our experience, and there's a lot of there's a lot of emphasis on this, and it's important that we are creating our experience from birth to death, one thought at a time. We as human beings cannot experience anything other than via thought. People say, well, what about pain? What about this? What, ab what about the senses? You can't experience pain without the thought. It's impossible. And that's why when people have intractable pain, say from cancer, what they do is they cut the neurosurgeon and they can't relieve the pain without putting the person in coma, one of the options is the neurosurgeon goes in and now they may be able to do it with a gamma knife without ever entering the brain, I don't know. But they cut the connections from the thalamus that brings the pain sensory input to, the, to our brain. Yeah. They sever that and the person has no pain anymore mm. because they can't think the pain. Now. The reason, why do we have pain then? Why do we have emotional pain? Why do we have physical pain? We're going to get to that because we, you and I touched on that briefly. This is a new paradigm. Mm. And a new paradigm, you actually even start looking at, it's not just that you, You have a new understand that then you have a new understanding of how things work, but with a new understanding of how things work, you then go back and look at research, and it has different it 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 has different meaning to you. Cool. So I I know that. So let me let me try a, th a third time here to answer your question. One cause, one cure. So I'll I'll go to the one cause. <clears throat> For. Nearly 30 years of my 35, if not, if not 
pretty soon afterwards, I started to see that there is one cause of, of, um, of all mental illness. One cause. The book of 680 pages or whatever as the DSM-5 or the ICD-10, <clears throat> there is one cause. It is chronic activation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which is the stress response. And, and that stress response is meant to be available to save people's lives. Or in the case of animals, I mean, if you want to look at nature, it's sometimes it's hard to watch nature movies because there are predators and predatees, right? Yeah. But it, it's what gets activated when the starving lion is starving and has to have something to eat or it's going to die, and it starts to stay chasing the zebra. Yeah. And it's what's activated in the zebra <laughs> yeah. who wants not to be the lion's lunch, but to survive another day for his family and his friends. Yeah. And that, so one of them wins. Yeah. Okay. But it, the, the, the whole system is meant for our ancestors, if you want to take it to the human level, when we had nothing but a big wooden club and were faced with a saber toothed tiger. Suddenly, in order to survive, you needed a massive discharge of strength. You needed strength and quickness, and you needed to be hyper clottable in mm -hmm. case it ripped a hole in your shoulder. You wanted to be able to put a fur on it and make it make the bleeding stop. Yeah. So it was adaptive, and you you wanted this five stage SWAT team called the inflammatory response, ready to go in with all five stages. And, and create an inflammatory response, which was part of acute healing. Yeah. You wanted to knock out the sex hormones, the growth hormones, and the, and the um, sex hormones, growth hormones. Um, what else don't you need? There's a third one. I'm, I'm just blocking right now. But... You want the message being you're if you don't survive, you're not going to have to worry about having sex. Yep. You're not going to have to worry about growing. Oh, the immune system. Yeah. You're not going to have to worry about fighting, uh, uh, getting a pneumonia or an infection or a cancer. Yeah. If you don't survive. So all those resources that are wrapped up in those systems are thrown into survival mode. <clears throat> That's good. Yeah. And it's meant to be activated once every 24 to 72 hours yeah. for up to 30 minutes. If anybody wants to read about the problem, um, they, I would suggest Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcer. Yes, I'll Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky, who's a yeah. wonderful, funny, brilliant uh, uh, researcher from, uh, from uh, Stanford. And that's what it's meant for. But Andrew, it's not meant to be caught up in worry, overanalyzing, guilt, shame, resentment, envy, upset that things aren't the way I want them to be. Billy, Billy doesn't like this. The world is not centered around Billy, yeah. which I struggled with for many years and at times <laughs> still struggle with. Yeah. Unresolved grief. It's not fair that I should, people should die that I love. Mm. I'm not saying those aren't human experiences. I'm saying that if we get stuck in them, it's one thing for us to get caught up <clears throat> for even three, five, 20, 30 minutes. But if we get stuck in that for days or weeks or years, it's lethal. Yeah. It's lethal. And in the meantime, I think what we call universal mind tries to wake us up, yeah. both physically and mentally, things that you that have in our present paradigm are seen as psychiatric symptoms. Mm. Our attempts, to me, they are gifts at every level. At every level, they are gifts that universal mind, God, Dave, Curly, whoever, whatever we want to label that, and I don't mean any disrespect or sacrilegiousness to people, 
But whatever is at the source of the universe, we are made of that energy, but, we, <clears throat> but we've been given a free will. We've been given a free will and we can think whatever we want to think and pay attention to whatever thoughts we want to and nobody can take that away from us. Nobody. And when Viktor Frankl, who was in three and over three years in the death camp, can say there is a space between the stimulus and the response. And that's where our freedom lies. As people understand the nature of universal mind and the nature of what it is to be human and the resources that are available, my experience is personally and with people is that that space gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more accessible. And, and they can access it sooner even when they lose touch with it. Yes. So to me, there is one that, you know, we, I, you know that there's other places where I go into the depth of what happens when, with the noradrenaline, the adrenaline, the, the cortisol, the massive amounts of blood sugar that's released from glucagon from the liver. We wonder why we have an epidemic of type two diabetes. Yeah. It's because the massive chronic, when, when people tell me they're spending eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day yeah. in stressful thinking. Now, here's the deal. There's never a time in my life that I was angry that I wasn't justified. <laughs> By whose thinking? <laughs> By mine. Yeah. There's never a time that a person worries that they're not justified yeah. given their thinking. <laughs> and it, again, it's difficult to talk about because it's innocent. And, and it's not, again, it's not about never having it. Yeah. But as the understanding in, in, increases. So there is one cause because, because, over, because what happens psychologically, let alone physically, psychologically, if we get caught up in paying attention to thoughts and giving life to thoughts that are unhealthy, our mood will go down. It, it, it's great that it goes down. It's an alarm. Our tension level will go up we'll feel more anxious. It's great. It's an alarm. Yes. We will experience pain or discomfort in our body someplace. There's a whole mechanism that goes through the, you know, there's more neural receptors in the gut three to five times than there is in the brain. Yes. So the, there's a message that goes from the brain down to the gut. There's changes that occur in the microbes. It goes back and it literally lessens people's tolerance for pain. Yes. So people start experiencing pain and discomfort at levels of input that most people don't. It's an alarm. Yes. But if I don't know it's an alarm, Andrew, I then start, those three things that I mentioned, mood going down, tension going up, discomfort in the body. If I don't know it's an alarm, I, I have more to be alarmed about now. Of course. I have more to be upset about than I, that I originally was upset about in the first place. Yeah. Now I'm upset about my physical discomfort, my mood going down, and my tension level. So, where where did where did I lose you? You were, you were talking about we get uh, upset with the symptoms and we start to realize that as our mood has gone down and our adrenaline levels are going up, and it, it's all sort of feeding itself. And we get into a cycle. We do, yeah. we do, and I and I think what's so fascinating about what you're saying, Bill, 
is that what this creates is, is what people would have described as this chemical imbalance, <clears throat> which, which is you know, used as a shortcut to, we need to put this right with some, some external source. And I think that this, this is where I, I think we, we come into the, um, the whole area of antidepressants, because what you've described so perfectly is, is the run up. And the sense that uh, people are frightened by their experience, um, you know, the, the, the panic attack, the notion of a panic attack, very similar in many ways to the experience of deep depression. The, the symptoms are so compelling and so severe we don't understand what you've just been describing and the whole thing fuels itself and then we go to we present ourselves at the doctors are diagnosed with depression or anxiety and given some tablets so t t tell me how you would would respond would you you describe what you've just described mm. I presume you've, you've prescribed antidepressants many times in the past. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and again, it's, it's, it's a challenge to do this in, in such a short time. It'd be nice if we had about eight days. Yes. <laughs> but, um, uh, and, but do, do you know that uh, we are coming to Copenhagen in May, by the way, to Great. do a pro May 17th to the 19th in okay. Copenhagen. Yeah. But um, so, yeah. Um, how do I do it? Well, one of the things, you know, you can't, I think one of the mistakes that I certainly made, have made many times, uh, is to try to teach people when I didn't have a student. So to me, one of the first things in my relationship with a patient, a client, is to get a student. Yes. So how, how do you do that? You know, and, and I know I'm talking to the choir here, but people do not care what you know until they know that you care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They, they don't. And that's a, that can be sound as a simple idiom. And, and, but if I'm having trouble getting a student, one of two things are happening. Either they don't know that I really care about them as a human being, right. or they're not, they, that I haven't gotten credibility, that I have something that's that's worth them listening to. So, the, but the first thing is to is the, we call rapport, right? Is mm -hmm. is for the person to really know that I'm on their side. Yes. <clears throat> and to me, one one of the things that you, you, I might have said it in things you've heard, but is right from the beginning is to tell people, listen, please don't don't feel like you have to answer any question that I ask, mm -hmm. unless you want to, mm -hmm. because. Uh, because because I, I, I'm, I, if I ask a question, it's not to get nosy, it's to try to understand your life and your challenges. But, but I want you to feel free because I'm, and also to know that I'm not going to judge you because I, <clears throat> I think people do the very best they know how to do until they know how to do better. Yes. Everybody, yes. everybody yes. has always done the best they knew how to do at that moment. And people say, no, I, I made bad decisions. I knew that there was something better. And I, I say to them, did you feel capable of doing that better thing? Mm -hmm. Well, no. I said, well, that's what I'm talking about. That, that the things that er you always did the best you felt capable of doing at that moment, yeah. given your level of understanding. So, mm -hmm. so when, when I, first thing I want to do is to, is to, before I do anything about the solution, is to uh, is to to me to take time to clarify that there is a problem. So I I do like I said I have people rate themselves zero to five on worry, yeah. zero to five on I kind of you know I think of it now more as past, present, and future. Yeah. So what what do people how do people hurt them with thought from the past? Well, there's Sid says there's an infinite number of ways to use thought, mm -hmm. but but there's about seven or six or seven that are prominent. We're, uh, from the past, people beat themselves up with either guilt or shame for their mistakes. They don't forgive themselves, or they don't forgive somebody else. They say, I want peace of mind, but I'm never for gonna, gonna forgive that person for what they did to me when I was six mm -hmm. or 10 or whatever. And the third thing is grief. 
you know, I, I, I haven't been able to be at peace since this person died or, or these three people died in five years or whatever, that they haven't come to peace with life on life's terms from the past. Yeah. In the present, I would say upset. <clears throat> people get caught up in upset that things are not the way they want them to be. Yes. Um, we talk about how wonderful the present is, but it's to be, if you're present in the present with a clear mind and a light heart, that's different than being present and being upset about the way things are. <laughs> and the other one is, is moment to moment in life. We, I think in the present moment, we are either driven and jerked around by insecurity and ego, or we're guided by mind. Mm. One of those two things. Mm. So I ask people to rate themselves on guilt, resentment, gr unresolved grief, upset, drivenness, or, or being guided. Mm. And then about the future, there's two, worry, yeah. worry, and overanalyzing. It's another, it's another outgrowth of, 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 I've got to find the answer. I've got to find, and they keep, we keep going to our intellect, even though, and I, I may, you may have heard me say, uh, Woody Allen in the, in the movie Sleeper, he woke up after being asleep for 20 years, and he said, 20 years, I could have been halfway through my analysis. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> George, George Pransky used to always say, if you haven't, if you're not closer to the answer, in two to three minutes, you're probably using analysis. If you're not closer, you're probably not going to be closer in two to three decades. Well, that's really interesting. And this is the rumination challenge, isn't it? You know, rumination being what cows do. And if you're ruminating on a problem for kind of more than 10 minutes, like who it is, you're not going to solve it. And, uh, and we, we just overthink our way into problems very often. Right. Such a challenge. So then I ask people how many hours they sleep mm. out of 24. And oftentimes it's not very many, it's four mm. to five, mm. unless they're taking something, <clears throat> drinking or, or you're taking medicines or stuff to sleep. And then let's say they say even six. And I say of the 18 hours, of the 18 hours that you're uh, awake, how many hours are you in a state of stressful thinking? Mm. Wow. Mm. It's not unusual to hear 12, 14, except when I can get present at work or now I'm even having trouble getting present at work or except when my grandchildren come over for two hours twice a week. <laughs> you know, there's, there's maybe a few things where islands where people being present is more important than being in their thoughts. Yes. My late wife, used to, Sue, used to say, I've realized that moment to moment I'm either in my life or I'm in my thoughts. A lovely way of putting it. Very different experience. Yeah. So, so as I so now that they're, they've admitted to me that they're spending twelve hours activating a, a stress response in their body oh. <clears throat> that is is meant to be activated for thirty minutes once every twenty four to seventy two hours. Yeah. Now I've got a student, Andrew. Usually I have a student now. Yeah. Because they're, they're, they're now see, and, and they see the, pr the price. When I, when I show them, you get depressed, then you get irritable, and then you get disconnected yeah. at the end. That's, those are the people that can walk into a, to a theater or a rock concert in France with an AK-47. Yeah. Because they're at such a state of or a, a nightclub in Long Beach, California, or Paradise, California, recently, because they're so in such pain emotionally that their life no longer, they're, they're no li longer has any value. And they're angry that nobody's been able to give them a solution. Yes. So they're not going out alone. Yes. Now, that's an extreme, but, with, but people start to see, and then, if you get with anxiety, you get tension, then you get panic attacks, then you get obsessive compulsive rituals to try to, it's, you know, it used to be an anxiety disorder. It's not an anxiety disorder in the DSM-5. OCD is not an anxiety disorder because they've seen a little bit that it's not an anxiety disorder. It's an attempt to deal 
and lessen the anxiety that they're creating with their thinking. Yeah. So the rituals are a way of trying to reflect. And then, and then if that fails, the next thing is disassociation. Oh, yeah. Periods during the day where you dissociate, and it's like the the um, it's like the um, the the breaker on the electrical system turning things off for two to three hours because you don't know how you're not using electricity with common sense. Sure. And eventually people, as you know, and at the ultimate case, just like the total disconnected violence, the total, the total bottom of dissociation is people who dissociate into four or five personalities. Sure. It's dissociative identity disorder, because if they don't, and I asked one lady, I said, what if all four of your, personalities existed together they she said i'd either be psychotic she had a moment of insight or i'd have to commit suicide what you're describing is touching me very deeply bill because i i became quite seriously psychotic myself because i, I was literally at the point of dissociating and psychosis has has a positive side to it doesn't it, it it's, it's yeah, absolutely it's it's mind saying it's an alternative to to suicide Yes. I, I have created such a painful existence in, tell me if this isn't true, Andrew. Absolutely. I have created so much pain in my head, in, in, the, I, in my world, in my head, I have to go to another world. Yes. I have to, I have to get to another world, even though it's not going to be perfect. Yes. It's going to have its problems. If I stay in this one, I can't continue to exist. Wow. Wow. And do you That's know, a whole new, whole new way of seeing it, isn't it? it? It is. And just to make the link back to the, to the principles, I really got the principles. I had an insight around psychosis because I realized that what I'd done is create a very extreme version of what we all do. And the moment I kind of made the connection between what the principles say about creating our experience of life and psychosis, I got it. I thought, right, I'm in. And, and I, had, I was stuck in an intellectual understanding for quite some time, actually, Bill, because I thought, well, why haven't I heard about this before? Why wasn't I taught this as part of my training to become a professional psychologist? And I kind of resisted it, I suppose. But then once I had that insight, I went, oh, okay. I, I just had a very extreme version. Yeah. You know, what you just said, Andrew, is powerful in that it's natural because that's what we've been taught to do is to try to seek to understand things intellectually. Yeah. And when we talk about understanding, that's what we have to clarify that, that this is insight-based uh, understanding. It's not intellectual. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not intellectual. And if you even look back at the research in, in, in psychotherapy, at, across, you know, at the level of understanding that psychotherapy was before the principles, it, it's been shown that it's not, the psychotherapy, even when there is progress, it's not like this. Yes. It's like this. Yes. Yes. That that's what the research shows, that there's moments of, of where a person is stuck, and then they have an insight. Yeah, a plateau. And, and then they, they go along, and then they have another insight. Yeah. And then they go along. So from the distance, it looks like this, but it's not. It's, yes. it's incremental insights, and yes. change is never, change is never uh, gradual. It's impossible. No. It, because by definition, I mean, it looks that way, but change is always instantaneous. Yes. That's yes. What the definition of change. Yeah. And that's from insight. Now, one of the differences, a huge difference in this paradigm shift, like I said, we could spend 10 days, is that the insights that are valuable are not insights about, oh, gee, I'm, I'm treating my boss, I'm reacting to my boss like I did my father. You know, those things will get you, or to my spouse or whatever, that'll get you a cup of coffee and maybe a, maybe a little bit better um, relationship. But if you don't understand, but what this is about is having insights into the nature of these principles. Again, I'll go back to the nature of human beingness, being divine energy in a form. And if people feel uncomfortable with that, Dave energy, curly energy, whatever, and that we have resource, we are directly 
not just connected to, we are that wisdom that, that creates this incredible beauty of nature that I look out the window at. It, it, everything that I see it, that we have access to that. So what's happened in the last 35 years for me, I would say every six months is that I'm not one of those people that, you know, got, you know, knocked off his horse and suddenly could see <laughs> it's been, it's been little by little. And it, it's not that I ever, like I said to you earlier, I learn I, I have learned very slowly and I forget very quickly. So it's not that, you know, Sid always says you can never go back, but and, and there's truth in that to some degree if you really see something, but you can get caught up again and, and appear to go back. And then, but because of what you know, mm-hmm. your, your sensitivity to being lost mm-hmm. and your stress tolerance is, is lower, so you catch yourself quicker and you let go of your, of your attention to your thinking and you, and you, access this wisdom beyond the intellect and 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 you're back on track again you're like that little italian game they've got a, a fancy version of it now but what's that one that the little guy that with the hat um do you know what i mean that the, oh. the, the game uh, oh shoot he's a little italian guy he's got a little hat on and he goes and and then he gets trips over something he falls down into a, a ditch and he comes out and 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 you come out quicker yeah. You come out quicker. So yeah. in answer to your question, to me, there is one cause. It's chronic, innocent, innocent misuse of the gift of thought. Wow. Yeah. And if you will, you can go backwards. You say, I could say, well, the problem is chronic chemical, biological, and neurotransmitter dysregulation in the brain and the body <laughs> via complex mechanisms and even what we call epigenetic mechanisms. Mm. Do you know much about the whole gene stuff? That's a great deal, eh? Well, uh, can, can I do two minutes? Please. So the genome study in 2007, they really, these scientists, I mean, that's 12 years ago is all. Mm. They thought they were going to find up to 130 to 40,000 genes. Mm. They found that we had 25,000. Tomato has 34,600 genes. <laughs> Tell me mine doesn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> Tell me that mine does not have a sense of humor. There's an inchworm that has 23,600. <laughs> and the number originally was at 26. Now that it's gone down, down, we're at about 24,000. But 25 is a nice round number. Ooh. Here's the incredible thing. These, the reason they, they thought there would be over 100,000 is because the genes control 100, 000, about approximately 100,000 proteins, 100,000 factories in our body. Yeah. And so they thought there would be one for every protein and then another 25,000 at least foremen checking on the job yeah. of the genes to see, because all of our systems in our body have all these backup systems. Mm. Okay? Mm. Well, to their amazement, they 25,000. To their utter amazement even further, they found that only one in five of our genes are on at any time. It's like a ceiling with 25,000 light bulbs, and only one in five of the light bulbs are lit at any time. When we are at peace, there's a whole article that I could send you to from 2004, and it's been updated in Nature, actually, in Britain in 2011. But there is a whole physiology of resilience, of mental well-being, yeah. where galanine, polypeptide Y, DHEA, these are prominent instead of cortisol, glucose, the adrenaline, noradrenaline, yeah. the stress response. There's a whole different physiology when we are at peace. Yeah. It has maximum immune function. It has maximum productivity. We are built, we are built for incredible. Yes. Yeah. Okay, now, so once people, once people start to, even epigenetically, if we're in a chronic state of stress, we're turning off the most healthy genes yes. and having to turn back up genes to stop the bleeding, to stop the flooding, to stop the, the biochemical dysregulation yes. that, that is called 
in the in stress research they call it the allostatic load yeah. it's the physiological and psychological burden of the chronic state of mental stress yeah. so we could say that all of that now b before that is chronic activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis before that is the chronic innocent misuse of thought mm. and before that is the lack of understanding of what we are as human beings the resources that we have available and how we're creating our experience wow you've just explained it beautifully so so it, it's this this deep understanding this love and understanding at, 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 at deeper levels that is the key to not getting trapped it is the cure. It's the anti. I, I want to write an article, and I will, but the, the, a chapter or whatever, that understanding, insight based understanding of the nature of what we are as human, the nature of divine nature of, of mind, and what we are as human beings, and what we're a, man, that we're a manifestation of that, and how we're creating an experience, that, that, that what I'm going to call the you factor, yeah, yeah. is is the antidote to the problem and it's preventative it's the vaccine also wow this is being taught now in different number of different countries in grade schools and and in it's been researched in tampa florida area i think in 12 or 15 schools in grade schools and 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 in um and, and teenagers in high schools well, if kids start learning this, they're going to have a psychological immune system that's going to have them go through life's challenges. And there are very real challenges. Cool. There are sudden deaths of loved ones. There are losses. There are illness. There's financial things. There's people, you know, whatever. But we are, it's clear to me that we are given whatever we need if we know where to look to go through anything and once people start to really have that be real for them there is no fear there can't be because even death loses its sting indeed and and anything in between loses its sting i used to be deathly afraid of being paraple paraplegic quadriplegic mm -hmm. There's a one. Have you heard me mention the book uh, of "Flying Without Wings"? Arnold no, Bicer. No, you mentioned that, but no. You might write it down. Ar yeah. "Flying Without Wings," Arnold mm. Bicer. Mm. Like long before the, it's a, it's a little thin book. He got polio and became quite. He was a physician who won the U.S. Amateur Tennis Championship, and four weeks later, he came down on his way to, to answer his rec after finishing his internship, he was driving to. Um, his assignment with the army for the because he got drafted into the Korean War in 1950, yeah. and started feeling bad. Pulled into a Navy hospital. Woke up in an iron lung, quadriplegic from polio. Six months before the polio vaccine was discovered, wow. spent the rest of his life quadriplegic. Yes, and he is one of the funniest, joyful, alive human beings ever. And he talks about his journey from yeah. total despair to realizing that everything he had needed was all has always been inside of him. Wow. So my, my wife was telling me, Linda was telling me she was watching this man from, and you, when you share these examples, it's not about shoulds. Oh, I should be able to be that way. It's about having hope awakened to know that, that, there is within all of us. That's what we're made of. There's a man from Australia who has no arms and no legs. I don't know if you've ever yes, seen, I've seen him. him. I've seen him on YouTube. Yeah. And he's got a little two inch. Yeah. And he, I guess I haven't heard him, but she said, he says, listen, I would be a liar if I said every day I didn't have thoughts come into my head about what my life would be like if I had arms or legs yeah. and legs. Yeah. However, I, it's very clear to me that any time I spend giving life to those thoughts, I give less life and less enjoyment to the life that I have. Beautiful. Wow. 
So uh, let me answer the question about antidepressants. If that is yeah, that okay? Please. Or, but did you have something you wanted to say first? Well, or? no. It was really just to, just to first of all, I want you to to know that I, I've. I've had a feeling all through, through that last 10, 15 minutes of the conversation that I, I got into a very quiet place inside. Mm. And, mm. And, and that happens when truth is being shared, mm. doesn't it? Yeah, you know, the Hebrews have a saying um, that um, words spoken from the heart uh, reach the heart. Yeah. And I think it's another way of saying, Andrew, what you just said, that, when, that words spoken from truth which is from the heart, really, I think, uh, 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 metaphorically, reach, reach the truth that, that is inside of everybody. And the times that I've had these, these incredible people come out of full-blown psychosis, and there's, there's not hundreds of them, but it's happened a number of times, and I know that it's because when it's happened is my heart was in the right place and I spoke truth at a pure enough level that it hit the truth inside of that other person and they woke up to that place that cannot be damaged or even scratched. Wow. And, and I can really resonate with that because I remember the day I first saw a glimpse out of my psychosis. My father took me for a walk on a beautiful May sunny day down by the, the canal near the hospital where I was staying. It was the first time I'd been let out. And for the first time in tune with nature, I started to hope again. Wow. Wow. Up until that point, I'd been locked up pretty much 24 hours a day. I wasn't allowed out. And, and wow. I felt my life was hopeless. And wow. I was a psychologist. <laughs> well, but, you know, I mean, there's, there's probably not an accident that I'm a psychiatrist and you're a psychologist because I think we truly have always wanted to be a healer. But we've also known that in order to do that, we had to find a way to heal ourselves. To, you know, to come. That's why I went into it. Of course, to some level, but, yeah. but not the only reason. No, but it was yeah. certainly a powerful one. Yeah. Of course, of course, me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Bless you, Bill. Um, so yeah, just just coming back to to antidepressants. I mean, we could talk about this for hours, and maybe we should do some uh, a follow up if we we can't kind of get get to sort of some place where we we've, we've run out, which I'm sure we won't. But th this sense that this this chemical imbalance created, then it seems easy to be able to offer something which may in some way be able to impact this chemical imbalance. Um, what's your take on this? Well, I think that's absolutely true. You know, if, if we, all we've had to offer is, if, if we, if, if there's all kinds of research that are pointing to, if you've had so many adverse events in childhood, if you've had so many adverse events in adulthood, you will have. There's another wonderful book that you want to read. It's by uh, Bowman. It's by Marilyn Bowman. Yeah. It's called Individual Differences in Post-Traumatic Response. Wow. Problems with the Adversity Distress Connection. Yes. She's a PhD psychologist, Marilyn Bowman. It's incredibly, you can see it's a little, it's not huge, yeah. incredible research. Yeah. Keith Levin's turned me on to this probably 20 years ago. I meant to see if she's still alive and she's from Vancouver. Okay. So, so our, whole, our whole paradigm is that life is always impacting you mm. and, and it, you're going to be stressed from it and you're going to, it's going to even damage your brain. Yeah. Because the grain of truth is if you don't know how to let go of the, and not be at the mercy of the memories and the and the uh, and yeah. the recollections then then you will stay in a chronic state of chronic activation Absolutely. of this response and it'll look like that event is what caused it yeah. rather than what you're doing innocently yeah. no judgment yeah. what you're doing innocently in the moment so so if if the only if we think it's from the outside in and what happened 30 years ago, none of that can be changed. Yeah. So the best I can do as a physician is to give you some chemicals 
that will try to ameliorate the biochemical dysregulation and the epigenetic changes that are occurring to try to deal with that. And, and thank, thank God, Dave or Curly, that, that there have been, because there is no doubt that antidepressants have saved people, some people's lives. Yeah. But they're, they, they don't, they're not made, they're made by humans. They go, to, if you put something in your body, like if you put an antipsychotic in that goes to try to, 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 to ameliorate or soften up the massive amounts of dopamine in the basal ganglia of the brain, it goes to the whole body. Yes. It doesn't just go to that area. Yes. So the antidepressants have a whole myriad of side effects, uh, sexual yeah. side effects, yeah. some of them weight gain, some of them this. But, but for some people, they're life-saving. Yes. So and me too. I think I think the issue then becomes how do you not spend the rest of your life on them? And you've already kind of given us the the, the, uh, the in on that. This yeah. understanding. So when I come to when people come to me and they say, now this will sound kind of different, Andrew. They say, I want to get off my antidepressants. I want you to start tapering me off my antidepressants. Uh, and I I tell people I will never have as a goal with the patient to get them off their antidepressants. They say, what? <laughs> I say, my only goal that I'm real, one, real, willing to work with with you, and it's okay if, if you don't, can't, don't wanna go there, is for, to help you have the deepest level of peace possible. Brilliant. Now, what I know is that as that occurs, the medicines, are get have less and less needed and oftentimes they start having more and more side effects yes because they're now a foreign body yes even more than they were before i had one lady that lithium had kept her mostly out of the hospital although she'd been in the state hospital at least once and maybe twice and other admissions and if you want you can uh, you google she's one of the people on on uh, Stories of Hope, Dr. Pettit. Oh, yes. yes, yes. There's five stories of hope. And she said, and her mother had heard about me, worked at the hospital where I, and she referred her, and, and she had the diagnosis of bipolar disorder, which, which mania often saves people, many people's lives. Mm -hmm. Be, I had one man that the last thought he had before he went into a full-blown manic episode was to kill the wife that he loved and his two beautiful sons so that they wouldn't have to suffer like he was from him being a failure economically. His full-blown manic, and then himself, yeah. his full-blown manic episode, Andrew, saved four people's lives. And it got the cavalry involved. Yeah. Uh, in, I don't know, in Britain, uh, that's a, maybe not a good metaphor, but- No, got, we do, we do have the, the cavalry. cavalry. Yeah. It, it, got, it got help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you're if you're setting on fires on the main street in town or running around with no clothes on and ten in five degrees Celsius or zero Celsius, yeah. you're going to get attention. Sure. So so that's a whole nother ball game. But yeah. so she she said, "You don't understand, doctor." When I talked to her about innate mental well-being and that everybody is made of, she said, "I've got this illness. <laughs> There's no way I can get healthy." And evidently, I think I said it with a lot more grace and gentleness than she portrayed, than she heard it. <laughs> but, but I thought that I'd said, you know, it, it's unlikely that you will if you hold on to that belief. Wow. But what she says on the, on the video, she says, well, with that attitude, you're certainly not going to get any better. <laughs> and she left the office and she was pissed. Mm. Who is him to yeah. suggest that I could have a happy life? <laughs> And she, and then, and then she said she had this moment of insight as she was walking home. She only lived a couple of blocks from the hospital. What, what if he knows something that I don't know? Yeah. What if what he says is true? Yeah. And as she started to understand the principles incrementally through insights, yeah. she would start having toxic um, symptoms from her lithium. 
Yes, yes. If you have if you have your lithium level is too high, there's a whole myriad, and we don't have to go. But two of the big ones are tremor, right, and and GI nausea, uh, diarrhea, sure. right. Well, and so we, I'd say, I'd check and see if she had any fee. I'd say, do you know, do you have any other symptoms? You know, I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something physically. Yeah. And uh, we'd get a blood level, and the blood level would be totally in the normal range. But I'd lower her lithium. And her symptoms would go away. And then she'd have more insights. Yeah. And then the, she'd get nut tremor and diarrhea. We'd lower it. She finally got to the point, Andrew, where she could not take a – she had been uh, on 1,800, I think, 15 or 1,800 milligrams of lithium for years. Wow. She good. could not take a 150-milligram tablet of lithium wow. without having diarrhea and tremor. That is a beautiful journey, and and I and I, and it's kind of it's it's wonderful because it resonates with inside out. So it's it's basically the the, the body putting itself right and saying I don't need these anymore. The the body naturally started epigenetically started yeah. to because the person got to be at peace. So I tell people, listen, my only job, my only thing that I'm willing to get behind is helping you have the deepest level of peace possible. Beautiful. If I have somebody on 800 milligrams in the old days, 800 milligrams of Thorazine, and they got down to, and, and they, this young man was threatening to kill his parents while they were sleeping on 800 milligrams of Thorazine, and he kept going down, and at 200, they left. Not, be, not And they told me later, when I called him, why did you stop coming? Because we know that he needs his medications and you're trying to get him off his medications. I wasn't trying to get him off his medications. As he was having insights, he was sleeping up to 14 hours a day. So I had to keep lowering it. They, I said, what do you think we should do? They said, you got to lower his medicine. But they got frightened and I didn't, I didn't teach them well enough. And I always did. That was 1984. Mm -hmm. After that, I always made sure the parents, because... If he would have ended up needing 35 milligrams or 50 milligrams a day of Thorazine, but that allowed him to go to college, to go to medical school, to get his PhD in physiology and become a researcher in schizophrenia at the NIMH, so be it. Yeah. So be it. It's not about the medicine. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And this about is peace of mind. It's so it's powerful. Yeah. Peace of mind. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I love this, I love this message because I think it's it's different, it's uh it's fascinating, it's powerful, and it kind of removes the fear for people who are who are on medication, fearing coming off them because there is nothing to fear. Well, there's nothing to fear unless you come off of them because you want to get off your medicine and you don't have the understanding too quickly. And and I think the point that you're or making, if you, or if you, yeah, if you don't have if you if you haven't gotten the understanding to, to change the physiology, beautiful. You know, pe people start getting anxious again when they they say, "Oh, I'm in withdrawal." Well, they're not in withdrawal lifetimes if they've done it slowly, but they're now they're still creating six to eight hours a day of. Yeah. of anxiety and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so they need x and then when they're when it's down to three hours a day they're going to need less medicine when it's down to an hour when it's down to less than 10 minutes a day i had one lady she said when i came to you doctor i was i had 10 di no set six diagnoses or eight diagnoses and i was on like six seven medicines and she was completely off all medicines but my goal had never been that my goal was peace of mind wonderful Wonderful. And we never, her, her, her four hours a day of obsessive compulsive rituals, we never once talked about her rituals. But as she got more at peace, they went from three and a half to three to two and a half to two to da, da, da. She said, probably if I do it at all and it's only periodic, I'll do it for up to three minutes a day. Yeah. Because, because she doesn't need it anymore. And wow. again, it's not about being perfect, Andrew. I uh -oh. please, I, I hope people hear that. It's it's about direct. One of my favorite sayings is direction is the key. Yeah. If you're in the United States, 
and you're trying to get to Alaska because you've heard how beautiful it is up there and, and you're going in the summer, it is better to be going five miles an hour north from Michigan than it is 80 miles an hour south. <laughs> because direction is the key. Yes. And if people can just be filled with, you know, Sid repeatedly said, gratitude is the key. Isn't it just? If I can read one quote, well, yeah. you, you know, from The Missing Link, I would encourage people that haven't to read The Missing Link or to read one of Sid Banks' books and eventually read all six of them. Yes. And to go to www.sidbanks.com yeah. and watch the videos. Totally. Because, because this is the man this is the man that was allowed to see something profound and the rest of us are first, second, third, and fourth generation people. And not that we don't have something to contribute, but if you, if you were learning relativity, I would first go back to, to Einstein's three 1905 papers before I moved on. Yeah. You put it so beautifully. And I think that's a really good point for us to probably draw to a close, Bill. You, you've, you've, we've painted a, a wonderful picture with that last conversation. Mm. And, I, and I think it's well worth people uh, pondering that because I think that, that there's a self, wonderful self-regulating mechanism at work here, which you just described so perfectly. Mm. Mm. And I've really enjoyed our conversation. You have touched me, actually, on a personal level. I really mean that. Oh, good. I look forward. Will, will I see you in uh, in London? I hope so. Yes, I I, so. I, um, I I will certainly be at the conference next year. I was at I saw you speak at, uh, at the last one, and uh, will you be speaking? Oh, well, I'm, I put my name forward, and I've been told that it's possible. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, it, do you mind if I if I use whatever influence I have to I tell would, them? That? I would love you to. Okay. okay. <laughs> so okay. my name's in the hat. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to see if I can, uh, you know, uh, you know, you don't want to cheat in the lottery. But, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I might help, help them peak uh, as they draw. Bless you, Bill. <laughs> bless you. Well, look, I've really enjoyed meeting you and speaking to you. And you thank did. you so much for giving me your time. And I hope we can maybe do this again. Okay. Okay, we'll bless do. Bless you, Bill. Thank Take you very care. much. Thank you.